Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Welcome back to another episode of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm so excited to be sitting here with my friend Megan Perkins. But before we dive into the pod, just as always, we'll drop into some breath together. So for Megan and I, we will close our eyes. And if you are in a place where it is safe to close your eyes, feel free to do so. But you can always breathe along with us. So Megan, myself, and if you'd like to close your eyes, just starting to slow down and shifting from the chaotic, busy, external world. Just feeling your feet on the floor, sitting up a bit straighter. And through the nose, inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at top. And sighing it out, letting the belly come to the spine. <sighs> inhaling up. Letting the belly expand, bringing that breath all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding here, and sighing it out. And one last one, inhaling all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding the breath. Rolling up the eyes as if you were to look at the third eye. Continuing to hold the breath here. And exhale, let it go. And the breath return to its natural state and rhythm and just flickering the eyes open. Megan, so good to see you. I'm stoked to be here with you. It's It's been years. It's been years that we've really dropped in, but we went deep when we first connected four years ago in Sedona and then Malibu and all the things. So welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. So good to see you. Thank you. It's so good to see you too. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to unpack this with you. Um, you know, it's uh, the conversation of detoxing is so fascinating to me. I usually do at least one sort of detox protocol with my dad, usually around January or February. We've been doing that for a number of years. Um, you are a regenerative health practitioner. So the word regenerative, that is a big word. And I recently went to my buddy, my friend's uh, farm up here in Santa Cruz, like literally at the top of the mountain. And they have a toll regenerative farm. Shout out to you, Manny and Terry at Bird Valley. But it is incredible, just regenerative farming. I'm not, could you, for the listeners and for my own clarity as well, could you explain what a regenerative health practitioner is? Yes, absolutely. So um, the focus is on a a process of detoxification and regeneration. And so whenever we're looking at the human body, we're really just looking at trillions of cells and two fluids. 
um, and lots of bacteria and different things that are synergistically supporting us in our life, but it's just a process of communication between cells, a process of communication between pathogens and those that are not that are harmful to us as well as those that are supportive of our lives. Um, and so what we're doing whenever we're doing this work is opening up the pathways to detoxify the body of all that's accumulated in there, be it um, heavy metals, chemicals, microplastics, um, all the things that are unnatural to our environment, as well as the bacteria, fungus, um, parasites that are growing in, in the environment as it becomes more and more backed up. So that's the path of detoxification paired with um, proper nutrition, really, really high quality nutrition, making sure that the micronutrient needs, needs are being met, that the mineral amino acid, fatty acid needs are all being met. And whenever you um, create an environment like this for the body, the cells have the opportunity to regenerate them, themselves. Um, because our blueprint, our natural blueprint within our cells is a blueprint for um, abundant health and wellness and um, proper you know, production of hormones and neurotransmitters and perfect balance. Um, what throws us off of balance is you know, exposure to all the things that we exist in in this world today. And so the process of detoxification always has to be um, paired with the process of regeneration so that while the body is removing all these things that are harmful to us, it's also supported in repairing what's been damaged, repairing what's been done over time so that it can heal and regenerate. So the basis of like regenerative health is to get to the point of regeneration then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And you, so is, is it a continual cycle kind of, of detox, regenerate, like walk us through like how, what this actually looks like. Mm -hmm. So where to begin? Well, um, whenever I work with someone, I have them fill out a health questionnaire where they are answering questions about different symptoms or things that they're experiencing in their lives, the way that they eat, um, what they're exposed to or different toxins that they know they've been exposed to in their lifetime. Um, and through that, through understanding where they're at, what diagnoses they might have or what they're experiencing, um, I then write a detoxification protocol that's specific to them. And the process is one of getting the elimination pathways open at a rate that is appropriate for them. Um, because we have four elimination pathways. We've got the kidneys, the colon, the lungs, and the skin. And so due to the fact that we're exposed to all these toxins in the world today, um, especially through modern farming practices, there's one toxin in particular, glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup um, that is water soluble. So it once it's sprayed in the soil, it's in the runoff, it ends up in the rivers, it ends up in the oceans, it's evaporated up, it is breathed in through the air. And so it's a large part of our environment today. And what glyphosate is, is a basically communication killer. Whenever one round of glyphosate is sprayed on the earth, um, over 50% of the earthworms are killed in that first round. It destroys the microbiome of the soil, the bacteria, the fungi, all these important networks that create the, path, the pathway of communication beneath our feet and allow the breakdown of nutrients in order for the plants to properly absorb. And so whenever this chemical comes into our bodies, it behaves in the same way. It acts mm. as an antibiotic. It's a carcinogen. It's a neurotoxin. It's a hormone disruptor. And we are all exposed to it today. And so the number one and first thing, the first area of focus, of course, now is healing the gut because to some degree having eaten the standard american diet for at least some portion of our lives having been exposed to things like glyphosate 
as well as many other toxins. You know, there was a study done in the early 2000s that showed through the extraction of cord blood that babies in the womb were being passed over 200 different toxic chemicals before even being born. And so today we're like facing being inundated with these toxic loads before we're even born into the world. And then we come into the world already inundated with them and, and then we encounter them more and they continue to accumulate in the body. So they have a major effect on the gut. Our gut has a really important microbiome um, that just like in the soil helps break down the essential nutrients, helps us to absorb and utilize those nutrients. Um, and so chemicals like glyphosate destroy that microbiome um, and throw off the entire balance of the system. So that's cool. the first area of focus is healing All the right. gut. Yeah, that's a, that's a good place to start. And I saw this fantastic documentary on Netflix a few months ago about the the gut uh, microbiome. Did you see that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a good one. So the, the microbiome, it's a it's like a, a term that we all toss around, you know, since you are this is your world. How would you just succinctly describe what the microbiome actually is? Mm -hmm. So it's hundreds of thousands of different types of bacteria um that synergistically exists within our gut and if you would just imagine a world where we were not facing exposure to all the things that we're exposed to every day that destroy and damage that microbiome um we would have a healthy and thriving microbiome naturally because it's in relationship to like i said the microbiome of the soil and so if you imagine us as um, a species that was just living in harmony with the earth um, and not contributing these toxins to our environment, then as we went and picked a fruit right off of the tree, um, it would have these tiny little hairs surrounding it with these tiny little bacteria or fungi that belong there that whenever we consumed it would contribute to a healthy microbiome in our bodies as well as like if we pulled something out of the soil, the soil would contain essential minerals and fulvic and humic acid and things that are supportive of our microbiome. Um, and so through that, we would naturally be colonized day to day um, through just being in relationship in harmony with the planet. And that's what that is. And also it, our mitochondria that's in our cells is a bacteria that has evolved to live synergistically with us. So we have in some cells, thousands of mitochondria. So we've got trillions of cells. And then within some cells, we've got thousands of mitochondria. So the number of bacteria that exist within our bodies that are there to support our processes in life is emits. And um, the yeah, so whenever we're coming into contact with things that are damaging or act as antibiotics or whenever we have something simple and a doctor puts us on a course of antibiotics without even like really knowing what's going on, it's actually quite damaging and it takes a long time for those beneficial bacteria and those colonies to recolonize and reharmonize um, again. So the, the microbiome is... Uh trillions of bacteria mm -hmm. okay got mm -hmm. it got it okay cool um now this has been something of interest uh mainstream for a number of years now i would say like right around the time of the pandemic i think a lot of people started to actually pay attention to this i remember going to safeway the grocery store back in like 2012 and seeing something called kombucha i've never heard of kombucha <laughs> before this uh, rewinding back to 2012 and i saw this floating stuff in there and i had no idea what it was i didn't really know how to pronounce the word but i looked at this thing and i was like this has got to be healthy. And I started drinking kombucha instead of coffee because I liked the way it made me feel. Then years later, people started to talk about kombucha. I was like brewing my own kombucha at that point. And 
a lot of times we think of like fermented foods or maybe kombucha being good for the microbiome. Why is like having fermented foods and drinking kombucha regularly and things like this not enough? Like, why do we need to go deeper than that? Well, um, fermented foods generally most of the time have a very, um, and what's the word, small bandwidth of types of bacteria that they're contributing to our microbiome. And like I said, the microbiome is um, created by hundreds of thousands of different types of bacteria that exist within the gut. And the microbiome repairs itself really through getting the proper amount of fulvic and humic acid that supports it, um, which comes from soil. But there are ways to supplement it today because we're not really, we have to wash our fruits and vegetables mostly. So we're not really getting soil from our food. Um, and from consuming foods that are fibrous and that are feeding the types of bacteria that we want to have thriving and growing in our in our bodies. Whenever we are consuming um, fermented foods, like I said, it's a it's a thin bandwidth of types of bacteria that are being contributed, which can too much of any good thing is no longer a good thing. And so if you have too much of some type of colony that is growing within your body, it's um, still going to throw off the natural balance within. So that's why it's um, it's more of a, rather than like contributing some beneficial bacteria to the body, it's more of a process of living a lifestyle that supports the healthy growth of, it, of many, many different types of bacteria that will be growing within you which is more through like diet, <laughs> like consuming fresh living fibrous foods. And there's another, you know, piece to that, which is that something like kombucha, um, it's contributing just uh, very specific strains of bacteria. And oftentimes it's bacteria that's been, the way that it's brewed, often it's bacteria that's been fed sugar um yeah. in order to grow and so then sometimes we end up colonizing our gut with a bacteria that's craving processed sugar that, because that's what it's grown to really love um that's fascinating that's uh, yeah so to get back to the question here about the uh, kombucha specifically um that's a really good point that it has the sugar so what what exactly is going on there because i know that the sugar affects us in that kind of uh like the parasite i don't know much about this, this is why i'm asking you about it but i understand there's a certain level of when we eat sugar that we have parasites within us then those parasites crave more sugar so it sounds mm -hmm. like what you're saying is kombucha because it requires sugar to be made is actually not as effective as we might think is that what you're saying right yeah interesting in a way it is colonizing our our bodies with um colonies that are that have been exposed to processed sugars and are um, craving those things now it is a step in it is a step in the right direction of course but there's so, always like deeper and deeper that we can go. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like a access point. It's a good starting place. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. That sounds that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for linking the sugar part. The sugar piece makes a lot of sense there. All right, so let's talk about sugar specifically in relation to parasites and we can start this conversation like some people listening might be familiar that we have parasites within us. I feel like, you know, speaking like from mm -hmm. like a starting place if kombucha is the starting place, the first starting place in terms of understanding that we may and do have parasites within us is we have bacteria within us, which I think most listeners of the podcast uh, are aware of that. But the next evolution is parasites, because it sounds absolutely disgusting to be like, wait, we have parasites in us. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, so if we breathe, we have parasites. It's um, a regular part of existence on earth. You know, it's why we deworm our pets um if you look at like people in native more tribal ways of living they all have some like yearly or twice a year process of cleansing their bodies of parasites and other types of pathogens usually with some type of plant or herb that grows 
native on the land where they live. Um, and so, yeah, we should be regularly cleansing our systems of these types of pathogens. And especially today, because I mentioned, okay, so you've got the glyphosate and the other types of chemicals that are damaging the gut. The gut is the place where we have our beneficial bacteria that's supporting our life and supporting so many processes in our body. For example, the gut communicates with the hypothalamus, which then creates this trickle effect that affects our body's entire production of hormones. So, and a gut imbalance will affect your hormone balance and so many other things. Um, and so whenever our gut microbiome becomes imbalanced and then there's space for other types of pathogens to begin to take over, that along with the fact that there is often um, the types of foods that are difficult to digest and, you know, the standard American diet, which the acronym for that is the SAD diet. Um, mm. And so when we're consuming the SAD diet or we have consumed the SAD diet and a lot of that waste has accumulated over time and begun to create tears in the gut lining. Real, real quick on this note, and please uh, let's get back to that. But the mm -hmm. SAD diet, the... Um, the American diet. What What is that just for people listening? Because I hear that I'm like, well, that's not me. I don't eat McDonald's. I rarely eat uh, fast food and I never drink soda. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious, like what exactly is this diet you're referring to? Yeah. So generally the sad diet is like a um, fast foods, heavily processed foods, um, packaged foods, and as you go into like deeper and deeper into a process of detoxification and like removing things that have accumulated in the body over time, um, what, what falls within the realm of like what, what you want to put into your body, it becomes narrower and narrower. And eventually it narrows down to just like, I want to consume things that are whole foods that are natural, natural to this world. So just to uh, confirm, when you're talking about like the, the standard American diet, it it's not like the extreme of fast food. It's what most of us actually, if we're to look in our pantry, like even I have Dave's killer bread, like something mm -hmm. like that, that would count. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like pretty much everything. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Processed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Please continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So when we're um, consuming different types of foods and also being exposed to all these different chemicals in the environment and it's creating tears in our gut lining, the little microvilli in our gut, which the gut instinct, right, is the instinct within us that says yes and no. Um, <clears throat> and so that's that instinct that we have whenever we just know or we don't know deep within ourselves um, is really directly tied to the health of our physical gut. And so whenever our microvilli they're fitting together in tight junctions and they're supposed to be performing this function of saying, yes, we want that. That's a nutritious for the body. No, we don't want that. That's harmful to the body. Whenever there start to be tears in the lining, cracks in the armor, um, everything begins to leak through and that's what's referred to as leaky gut. And from what I've witnessed and learned and been exposed to, most people in the United States today have some degree of gastrointestinal damage they've been run through some rounds of antibiotics they have um eaten some to some degree some level of processed food at some point in their lives and over time it's created some damage to their gut and their microbiome and so we have the gut leaking into the lymphatic system and like i mentioned we have trillions of cells and two fluids the two fluids are blood and lymph your is going around and feeding, nourishing liver. That was blood and what you broke up there? Lymph, like lymphatic fluid. Lymphat yeah, got it. Mm -hmm. And you have much more lymphatic fluid than blood. And your lymphatic fluid, it's like your sewage system. So your lymph is flowing around and your lymph nodes are like your little septic tanks. And the way that our body should be functioning is that the lymph should be... Um, processing cellular waste so your cells eat and your cells poop and whenever they and they die and um whenever that waste is created it goes into the lymph and your lymph should be filtering that out cleaning it out through 
through the lymph nodes and then delivering the waste to the kidneys to be flushed out of your body. That's the extent to which we should be dealing with in the lymphatic system. But when the gut begins to leak, now you've got undigested food waste in the lymphatic system. You've got glyphosate, hundreds of other chemical toxins, heavy metals, microplastics, fecal waste, um, negative bacteria, parasites, fungus, all these different pathogens um, making their way into the lymphatic system. Now, the growth of the pathogens often begins in the gut because like I said, we're eating a lot of foods that are hard to digest. And so whenever it's slow and hard to digest for us and the body's not digesting quick, quickly enough, that's whenever opportunistic um, fungus, bacteria, parasites are able to come in and start fermenting that food and creating colonies within us. So those colonies make their way into the lymphatic system and then they exist within our lymphatic system as well. And um, they just kind of set up shop. And then we have colonies throughout. And like I said, we're just a whole system of communication. We're all these cells and all this bacteria and we're just sending signals all the time. And so once you have these colonies that begin to thrive, they're sending signals to the brain asking for what they want. And then we become really thrown off, you know, thinking that these cravings are our own and we end up craving things that are we know are harmful for us harmful to us and that's kind of rooted in this um this deeper colonization so the process of detoxification is really one of taking your sovereignty back as well yeah absolutely i'd love to get into the spiritual emotional side of detoxification but just to close the loop here on the parasites so how is it that the parasites are communicating to us in terms of like craving sugar craving those things like what what is what's going on there yeah so um we like i mentioned we have a, a direct line of communication from the gut to the brain it's mm -hmm. called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And there, there is gut co brain communication always happening between the brain and the bacteria within the gut. And nine out of 10 signals are going from gut to brain. One out of 10 signals are going from brain to gut. And so the gut is frequently sending signals up to the brain, communicating about what's needed, what hormones are needed to be pr produced, um, things like that. And so whenever we're becoming colonized by pathogens, I mean, they have consciousness. And so it's an, it's a part, it's all one consciousness, but it's an aspect of the consciousness that exists within us that's sending signals for whatever the thing is that was the opening for that pathogen to begin to live within us in the first place. And so like it's asking for more donuts and more of whatever those things are. Um, and whenever people go through detoxification, um, we, you know, open up the elimination pathways, we change the diet, we start working with some biohacks, whatever the case is, and then we get to a point where we're taking some herbs that kill pathogens. And when we start doing that is when the cravings really, really, really increase mm. um, dramatically. Oh, wait, the cravings increase? Yeah. So as the parasites and the fungus are dying, um, you start really, really <laughs> craving things that feed parasites and fungus for a little minute there. That's really fascinating. It's very similar <laughs> to like when we're moving through depression or anxiety or grief, heartbreak, whatever it is. This is everything I teach with the breath process of accepting and surrendering to it. And as you do, it comes up more. So it's cool to see the correlation there. I really dig that. So mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing there is like, candidly just straight up like last week um i was just having one of those days and i got a, the big tub of ice cream and like the local place here in town which doesn't make it better that's local versus like baskin robbing it's, if anything it makes it just as bad or worse i mean this is they call it heaven and it is <laughs> heaven it's peanut butter swirls chocolate fudge vanilla ice cream and chunks of brownie and just mixed in there together literally ate that whole thing in a sitting like just like went to town next day all i could think about was that ice cream and it's super hard to find so when i was done with the day the day I went and got another one of those tubs and ate that thing for dinner. <laughs> so 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not proud of this, but this is a, actually I am proud of it. You know, it's not something I, I'm shaming myself for. I mean, it was damn good. And yeah. the reason why I bring this up is because that is a very good representation of like having it the one time. And then I was able to like not have it for like a week or something, but it was still in there. But then when I did have it, I ate the whole tub of it. Then the next day, that's all I'm thinking about. Then I had another tub of it. For me, what I had to do is like, all right, I'm going to the steam room. I'm going to the sauna. I'm swimming. I'm doing my squats. I'm doing my pull-ups. And I'm getting back on track and eating healthy, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like in everything you're describing here, it seems like part of it is the more we have that bad thing, be it ice cream, sugar, whatever your vice is in this specific moment, then immediately we're going to want more of it. And then one, it seems like we need to find a way that breaks the cycle for us, one. Mm -hmm. And then two, as we start to move forward, those cravings theoretically sound like they should come up again, right? Yeah, especially when you go through, whenever you're like really getting in there and and driving the pathogens out of the system. And then you do find yourself on the other side where you're craving things that are, feeding the colonies that are good for you so you start really craving oh, like living foods um it's a process to get through but it is it is all just like a, it's all consciousness and so it's like feeding whichever consciousness we we choose to feed and um it's a it's a it's a path of discipline in the beginning like but if you stay with that discipline for long enough then it just becomes your lifestyle and you feel so different you feel so good and your mind is clear and your hormone levels are straight and you have energy steady energy throughout the day and it's just worth it you know so i'm curious about the piece of like them coming back when you're removing them because i'm not sure i've experienced that like on the cleanses that i've done uh mm -hmm. be, albeit I, I think like a 14 21 day was probably like the usual length I'll, I'll go after so many days it just gets easier and easier and same thing now like it's probably been four or five days or something uh maybe a week since i had that ice cream and like mm -hmm. I, I i haven't regressed it's just been easier to your point because you start craving that you feel better in your body you want to feed your body good things and then all of a sudden for me like at some point I have a breaking point and then I regress and then it's kind of being back forth, back and forth. So would you say, because I'm kind of going back and forth, I'm not getting to that point of like having all of it come up because that's the piece I just have an experience where it's like those massive cravings because I'm on the right track. I've only experienced those cravings for when I'm off track, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so here's the, Generally speaking, whenever people are going into a, a stage, a state of detoxification, like there, there's so many levels to it. So it's not just cravings that are driven by like the pathogens, but there's also, we're working through um, emotional eating as well. Emotional mm -hmm. eating is such a deep one. Um, I would say that food is probably the first comfort and the first addiction that a lot of us have ever known. And whenever you get into a place where you're like, okay, I am just going to be consuming food that is natural to this environment that grew on the earth the way that it grew. Um, that feels great. That feels like an awesome idea. And then when you really get into it, you have like a, an emotional day, can really feel this like deep pull for something to just bring the energy down because we've got so much energy at a time within our bodies. And so if there's a lot of um, energy happening and emotional processing, a lot of energy in the nervous system, and we want to escape that experience, all we got to do is put something really heavy and slow to digest in the stomach. And then all the blood's going to flow there. And then we experience a food coma and we no longer have to, we're numb for a little while. And oftentimes um, we can, live our entire lives that way if we choose to eating heavy meal and then sitting with that in there for a long time and then heavy meal and then sitting with that and then a heavy meal and then going to bed um and so there's the emotional component as well but as for the pathogens driving the cravings it's just generally in the first few days of taking parasite herbs that those cravings will ramp up and it's because there's they're still alive within us and they're like 
they're dying and they're like they're like sending out their sos um got it it's the herbs piece that's doing it that makes sense yes yeah they're like oh shit like it's it's happening and um and another thing is that as they're dying they're often laying eggs and Mm. so 20 days later the eggs are hatching about um so it's good to do another round of herbs it's good to do it a, a few pulses of herbs in that way um to really get the system cleaned of those pathogens like that that's fascinating that makes sense too with the eggs so mm-hmm. what what kind of herbs are these generally that help to kill off the parasites there's lots of different ones there's herbal blends um i use dr morse's herbal tinctures a lot he's got one called parasite g which is parasite general and one called parasite m which is micro but it's like cloves herbs like clove wormwood walnut hull um but there's lots of different ones and um what else was i gonna say about the herbs i guess that's it yeah yeah and cool thanks for sharing that so uh this is where you come in right this is where mm-hmm. you would come in and you mentioned you do the initial like onboarding to see what people are exposed to their lifestyle all of those type of things and then you would mm-hmm. create a system with specific herbs is it mainly herbs that you work with i work with uh several different things so i have people change their diet and i can be flexible there i have my like my philosophy and if people want to really go deep, we can go there. But if people don't want to change their diet to the degree that I'm asking, then I can I can be flexible with them and still get them into a place of more cleanliness and detoxification within themselves. Um, so we do a, we do some diet change and then I make supplement recommendations. And that just depends on what's going on. So maybe I'm recommending some micronutrient support, um, some mineral support, amino acid support, um, maybe some biohacks for um, increasing binding and removing heavy metals and chemicals and microplastics from the system. Definitely some herbs to kill parasites, you know? Um, So it's a a range of different things that I'm working with. And Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in regard to your philosophy, what is like your general philosophy uh, for diet? And I mean, let's, let's use like a, uh, if you had a magic wand and you could just uh, heal the world, you know, forget about just America, the world, and maybe not like a magic wand. So it's totally, totally perfect. Uh, let me reframe this actually. So it's a little bit more accessible. This is America. Uh, most of my listeners are in America. Most of my listeners are busy professionals. They are into spirituality, mindful living, but they also are practical people. And a lot of us, aren't just going to, you know, have a farm or live on a farm. Obviously we have access to farmers markets, but for the common everyday, you know, busy professional into mindfulness and spirituality and wanting to just be more healthy and feel better in their body, what would be your philosophy of diet? Just like as a general um, recommendation for this segment, what do you say? Mm -hmm. There are some complexities um, because if you look at us, we exist in every, every zone of the planet. We found ourselves in the coldest and the hottest regions of the planet. And because we're so intelligent and we can ship food across the world and, and do all the things that we do, we found a way to make that work. But if you look at us as animals, um, all animals kind of have a zone where they fit the best, where their food supply is, where they have the proper coat to survive the winter or they don't and they're in a warm place and stuff like that. So um, if you looked at our bodies, I mean, without any innovation, we're clearly not designed to thrive through any cold winter um, since we don't have any fur. So you put us in the tropics, we could survive there easily with no clothes, um, foraging and finding fruits and nuts and seeds and coconuts and water or whatever we needed. Um, But that's not the case. So we exist in every zone and where we're existing in the the winters that we're going through and it makes it more complex. Um, But one thing that 
is really supportive of our health across the board is fruit. So we were talking about sugar. Um, this is really cool. So the mitochondria in our cells are what produce our energy through ATP. And so what our mitochondria does, those little bacteria in the cells, they take oxygen plus fructose or glucose and they produce energy. And so that's what we thrive off of. We thrive off of fruit sugar or vegetable sugar because that's what those are. Those are monosaccharides, which are simple sugars. Now, when we're consuming processed sugar, processed carbohydrates or complex starches, we're consuming disaccharides or polysaccharides. So mono means one, you know, um, di means two, poly means many. And so we're getting over with disaccharides and polysaccharides to more complex structures that our bodies have to work much harder in order to break down to get to the thing that we need. Because in order to produce that ATP, we need the simple sugar, the monosaccharides. We've got to tear it down to get to it, um, which is amongst many other things. Part of why processed sugar is harmful to us is because it's that longer digestion process, which allows the um, fungus and the bacteria to come in and begin to ferment it and stuff like that. So one, like my number one recommendation that I would make to people, no matter where they are, is that they could try consuming fruit until noon, only fruit until noon. Jesse Itzler style, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just have fruit till noon and in the fruit that you're consuming, um, your melons alone. So melons digest a specific type of way. So you consume your melons and you wait like 30 minutes and then the other types of fruit, which is generally most other fruits, acid, subacid fruits is what they're called. But oranges, apples, mangoes, peaches, pears, grapes, pineapples, all the things, those can be consumed together. And then you've got the really sweet, slow fruits, bananas, dates, figs, things like that. Those are different as well. You um, called them uh, sweet, slow foods, was it? Yeah, is they it, digest that slowly. That's why I figured. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. And so the melons and the all the other ones that I mentioned, apart from bananas and dates, um, would be really good for starting the day. A really excellent way to have high quality energy and not put yourself in really complex digestion early in the day. Um, if you think of us as like going with the sun, like in the morning, the sun's just rising, your digestive fire is just beginning to, to rise. And so putting things in that are easy to digest, really hydrating, really alkalizing, like full of um, electrolytes and nutrients, that would be the best way. And then of course, because of the complexity of the nature of the um, modern farming industry, supplementation of proper supplementation is also recommended, which is where I help people, you know, I can make mm -hmm. those kinds of recommendations. All right. So thank you. That's awesome. And I, I remember, I love Jesse Itzler. Yeah. He, he's the only one I've ever heard talk about fruit till noon. I thought it was kind of his expression and I've been hearing him talk about it since like 2016 or however long I've been following him. Um, but yeah, fruit till noon. So my follow up to that is I'm recently back on AG1 athletic greens and their recommendation is to drink it first thing in the morning. And then in the biohacking scene, we see so many different concoctions like, you know, mm -hmm. lemon water with Himalayan salt and apple cider vinegar. Like what, what do you think about taking greens, any form of greens or AG1 specifically, um, or this cocktail of apple cider vinegar that a lot of people like to do? Like, would you recommend that too, or just fruit till noon? Yeah, that's fine. Like first thing in the morning, those will, because it's like dehydrated, it's pretty much pre-digested. It'll just absorb straight into the digestive tract, like within yeah. 30 minutes oh. of drinking it. I figured that's what you'd say. So some quick hitters here. I've heard peanuts are bad. Um, I've heard eggs are not good. Uh, it, I've heard white rice really is better than brown rice. Like, could you just hit some of these uh, <laughs> ones where there's some controversy around these? Sure. So 
peanuts are extremely prone to mold, um, which is why the first allergy that started popping up heavily was peanut allergy. And if you remember many years ago, like hardly anybody had peanut allergies. And now there are peanut allergies and EpiKit pens in every school and allergies to many other things as well. That is due to the fact that we've got all this waste accumulating in our system and our body is like always on guard. And so because the kidneys are unable to filter out everything that's building up in there, the body's starting to reject things and saying like, don't put that in here. I cannot handle anymore. And depending on the experience of the person in their life, they reject different things just dependent upon what they've gone through. Um, so peanuts are really prone to mold um, and so, they, which creates a lot, of, puts a lot of mycotoxins in the system, which is damaging. Got it. Okay. So mm -hmm. peanuts, um, even if you don't have an allergy to them, uh, I'm asking for myself here. Cause I remember my homeopathic doctor telling me this like four years ago and I've slowed down on peanut butter a lot, but I still <laughs> love me some peanut butter. So, uh, mm -hmm. is it like, I don't want to say, okay, but, um, if you're trying to, maybe not do a full on detox and cleanse, but just be healthy. Like you can still have some peanut butter, right? Yeah, I would, I would say, um, I wouldn't eat a ton because that like, if you imagine us as like animals foraging in the world, we wouldn't find like tons of nuts to consume all at once. So it's mm. a challenging thing to digest, but, um, a little bit here and there would be fine. Everything in moderation if we're choosing yeah, yeah, of course. And I, I love that thought process. Like if we we're animal in the wild, like what would we, if, if we can get our mindset there, I think we can answer a lot of these questions for ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, cool. So, all mm -hmm. right. We, we covered the peanuts. Uh, uh, brown, there was white rice versus brown rice. I don't remember the other one I asked you. Maybe you remember. But... Eggs. Eggs. That was it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um. So eggs are their their mucus forming in the body and so they trigger the production of mucus um they also whenever researchers are doing research and like trying to grow viruses um or cancer cells they inject them into eggs and it's a great environment for those things to grow so um we always recommend people not to consume eggs during detoxification and in general, I don't consume eggs. That That's a bummer for me because I've been, uh, <laughs> I, I haven't bought eggs regularly in years. And I would say in the past month, I've been buying eggs every week and, you know, hard boiled <laughs> eggs, egg sandwich. Yeah. I've mentioned the Dave's killer bread. So yeah, I was, I was doing good with no eggs. I'll, I'll get off the eggs. Uh, that, appreciate you sharing that one. The next one was this one I find fascinating because I've heard this a few times in you know, the biohacking type community, like, oh no, it's a myth that brown rice is better than white rice. Like white rice is actually better. What are, What's your take here? Mm -hmm. So rice in general um, is quite difficult to digest and very like stressful for the adrenals. So the adrenals are producing cortisol for us and they're managing our neurotransmitter production, our production of hormones, our utilization of minerals. They have so many important jobs. <clears throat> and whenever we consume complex complex proteins or complex starches or carbohydrates, um, the adrenals are extra stressed during that process. And they have to produce cortisol in order to support that complex digestion, um, which leads to adrenal fatigue over time, dependence on stimulants like caffeine, um, anxiety, feelings of anxiety because of the buildup of cortisol in the body. So I really just don't recommend rice at What's all. your, yeah, the herd. So what's your recommendation or alternative um, instead of rice then? Quinoa. That's what I figured you were going to say. What about, um, you know, the the pearl cuckoos, couscous, like the uh -huh. big ones? Is that bad too? Um, I don't know. I have to... I'll get back to you. That stuff is so good. I have one that's, <laughs> it, it comes turmeric. So, you know, for me, I'm like, oh, it's got turmeric. It's got to make it a little bit better. You know? 
yeah um yeah why don't we speak about turmeric uh for a moment because that's kind of a, a buzz one for i i have several friends that are like kind of on the fence interested in their health and they're like turmeric that's good for you right you know like that's yeah. that was one that's starting to enter the mainstream a little bit more yes so turmeric's anti-inflammatory um it there's a compound in black pepper called piperin i believe is what it's called that really really boosts the effects of turmeric like dramatically so if someone's consuming turmeric in some way they should always crack a little black pepper with it um, in order to boost the effects properly um, the main thing about it is okay so it's anti-inflammatory so if we're struggling with chronic inflammation we're often looking at chronic inflammation due to toxin exposure, due to an accumulation of pathogens and fungus and bacteria in the body, for example. You know, like I mentioned, I helped my mom reverse her rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis, which is an autoimmune disease, um, chronic inflammation. Let's just highlight that. You just mentioned that you helped your mom to reverse arthritis. Mm -hmm. Like that's important to highlight, like let that soak <laughs> in. Would you like to share what uh, you reversed it within yourself if you feel comfortable to mm -hmm. yeah so um we for my mom we just got her away from all processed foods and onto a clean like plant-based diet i cooked all of her food for her and ran her through some parasite detoxification and that was enough to get her inflammation levels down to the degree that the doctor said she no longer had any detectable signs of rheumatoid arthritis, which she had had for many years. And she'd been on many different types of medication and um, all that. That's and amazing. so, yeah, thank you. Um, it's my favorite thing I've ever done. <laughs> yeah. She did it. Um, it's my favorite thing I ever supported her through. So, she, yeah. When she was struggling with rheumatoid arthritis, turmeric would have been a great way to mitigate those inflammatory symptoms. But the path of detoxification and regeneration is really getting to the root cause of those symptoms so that we're no longer struggling or dealing with them so that we can live a happy and healthy life and we're not trying to mitigate our pain all the time. And this kind of gets to the emotional and spiritual side as well of the detoxification. Could you speak to that a bit? Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's so deep. It's, it's all all the levels. So um, I guess we can mention briefly, you know, that we, when we met, I was um, serving some plant medicines. And I work with some psychedelic plant medicines still today. Um, and I have seen them do incredible things for people to unlock their minds and release themselves from boxes that they've been trapped in for their entire adult lives. There's things that they were programmed with since they were children. Incredible, incredible things. Um, but the people that I worked with, including myself, I would see us kind of hit a certain ceiling um, and still be engaging in certain behaviors or patterns or returning to certain things that were um, detrimental to us and coming back to the medicines for assistance with these things. And whenever I found this very grounded, very integrated path of the detoxification and deep nourishment, deep cellular nourishment of the body, I really saw some massive breakthroughs because we really do store the issues within our tissues. Um, we, we carry memories, our cells are carrying memories of everything that's ever happened to us and we hold tight these things. And so there's the cellular memory that whenever we start to detoxify and we liberate our body into a state where it's flowing and releasing, um, the emotional baggage that's wrapped up in the tissues that are bound um, is released with it. And one really cool example of that would be that I had a really long nail biting habit that started immediately when my dad left. So my dad left when I was nine and I started biting my nails and I bit them until I was 29. And I tried everything. I tried like the bitter nail polish. I tried 
putting fake nails on. I tried just like sheer willpower. Um, I tried asking every psychedelic for help. I asked every single one that I've ever done. Um, and I had such a deep, deep subconscious habit tied to this trauma that it felt like I would never break it. it I, I like surrendered to the idea that I might just be a nail biter the rest of my life. Like this might just be a thing that I could not get to. And one day I did a, a certain type of cleanse that really cleaned out my intestines and I released a lot from my intestines in a short 24 hour period and it broke the habit. And I didn't even notice until like three or four days later when I looked down and I was like, wow, my nails, you know, they, they look biteable. And then I realized that they all looked biteable and that I had not bitten a single nail like since. And the habit was broken without me even consciously choosing or being aware of it. And so when we release things from our body, it really unravels things from the, the psyche and yeah, the emotional trauma that's stored within us. It's incredible. But these are my Oh, look at those nails for those of you guys watching on YouTube. Uh, there they are. Love it. <laughs> Amazing. Congratulations. That's that's a fantastic story. And I know with my own experiences with psychedelics, just how frustrating it can be when you're like, I'm not just psychedelics, but doing all of the different sorts of things we do to integrate psychedelic experiences and um, just living a holistic life and being like, I am surrendering. I am surrendering. I'm doing everything I can, you know, and mm -hmm. trying so hard and then not trying and and, and being <laughs> like, okay, now I'm not trying and I'm surrendering in, in a passive kind of way. And it's like, wait, maybe I'm still just, it's a mind, it's mind boggling. So oh, where was I going with that? Well, with your, um, yeah. Oh, oh, you mentioned 24 hours, a certain kind of cleanse in 24 hours. Last year for the first time I did, um, I think it's called the colonic. It, that's mm -hmm. what's called when they put the tube in, in your butt essentially and flush everything else. Yeah, that was an experience. Um, was it something like that when you say a 24 hour uh, type of cleanse or what exactly was it, if you don't mind sharing? It was an enzyme cleanse. So it was a fermented plant-based enzymes. You you take the enzymes and they go through your intestines and they like, you know, enzymes are, you know, catalysts for life. And so there are living enzymes present in all the living food that we eat. So anything we don't cook, once we cook food, the enzymes die. But there are living enzymes in all the living food that we eat. And there are living enzymes that we produce within our saliva and our, um, um, in our pancreas and what those enzymes were breaking down everything that we've consumed and so these are fermented they're fermented for three years plant-based enzymes and whenever you take them they go in there and they just start liberating away things that are like really stuck up in there in your intestinal tract and like start and what came out of me was like a long rubbery like rope <laughs> essentially um mm -hmm. And yeah, when it, it, something very dramatic changed within me when it did. Um, but what you mentioned about like reaching that like state of frustration, there's mm -hmm. really something to be said about like, we, we really give it our best, but then I feel like the ceiling sometimes can be like just plain old neurotoxins and like gut damage preventing us from having a healthy hormone balance or our adrenals are not keeping us at proper energy levels so like our bodies are tired our cells are malnourished and so at the cellular level we're living in a state of lack and so like really addressing the health and well-being of our body at the cellular level and getting those fluids flowing and filtering out properly um, and cultivating and practicing the discipline to really show up for ourselves like that every day um can be so transformative it's 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 really something 
All right. So uh, thank you. So uh, now what's coming up for me, and this is specifically going to resonate with all the the plant and earth medicine uh, enthusiasts that are listening. Uh, a lot of times I think of Bufo, toad medicine, 5-MEO, which you and I are both very familiar with as being like that, that quicker access point. And I think that's why a lot of people that have never even smoked cannabis, let alone had any psychedelic experiences, will go like straight to the top with the toad because it is so fast acting, whereas ayahuasca or even a mushroom journey, something like that, not only is it hours and hours to sit through and reliving certain things in different kind of ways, but a lot of preparation specifically with ayahuasca. So I'm curious, would you say this enzyme cleanse would kind of be like the Bufo version where it's like the, the fast track then? Yes, um, generally I'll have people work to get their elimination pathways open ahead of time for at least a few weeks beforehand on a really clean diet where their colon is flowing and they're having like at least th three bowel movements a day their kidneys are filtering and they're releasing a lot of toxins so that they're like already they're not like compacted when the enzymes come in so that they can really get the um, maximum benefit and not to be too graphic, but you know, with the enzyme cleanse, I'm just going to call it that. I think you might have called it that anyways. Is this something that you're pretty much like on the toilet on, for all day or like what what exactly is the experience? And feel free to go however graphic you want to. So <laughs> listeners listen to with your own discretion. <laughs> it's yeah. different for everyone. Um, depends on the person and, you know, what they got going on inside. Um, but the day of you're taking enzymes throughout the day and then the following day is when you have your release so you go to bed and you wake up the following day you have your release um and that can that generally spans throughout the day but it's not for me it's not very urgent of an experience it's just like oh more 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 release coming and so then I'm just have more release um and it's not like food poisoning or it's painful and it's just coming up or anything like that Right. And like, right, I think right. that there, there's a chance that it could be if someone were really impacted, which is why I work with people to really make sure that things are moving beforehand. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to connect offline. I'm interested in that for myself. And uh, guys, at any point, like if any of this is interest of you at all, go to the show notes and click Instagram link there for Megan and give her a follow, check out her work. She's doing amazing things. Feel free to reach out to her. She's an incredible human, as you can tell, and be happy to chat with you. To kind of start to wrap this up, and I meant to talk about this earlier, but I'm just getting to it now. Talk with us a little bit about how when one person approaches their healing, how that's healing for the entire collective, because this is a very big uh, topic or a big concept. So I'd love to hear you unpack that a little bit. Yeah, totally. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so in my experience, and like now we've talked about psychedelics and stuff, like in my experience with psychedelics, especially, I've really come to um, feel deeply that, you know, we're all, we're all much, much more connected than we could ever perceive with the eye, that we are one interconnected consciousness. And that my body is a microcosm of the macrocosm. And um, for example, I'm, I'm sitting outside on my back porch and there's a river in my backyard, the Vermilion River. And uh, there's a lot of waste that's dumped into the Vermilion River. And I am, imagine and, and dream and feel and believe in miracles and have experienced them in my life. In that, you know, I can make a contribution through cleansing the waters within my own body, through cleansing the physical waters in my own body, which allows and opens the pathway for cleansing the emotional waters within my body, the releasing and the cleansing of things that have been built up and backed up for many, many generations, which completely ch transforms the way that I show up in the world, that I'm able to show up as my truest, most regulated, most authentic self um, and make contributions that my soul came here to make in this lifetime. 
Um, and with that, you know, always holding the prayer that this river will run clean, that as I make these changes that are disciplinary and sometimes hard and sometimes I have to take the long way, that um, I can walk through this world with confidence and, and contribute that um, contribute that frequency to the collective. And maybe one by one, a bit more of us will begin to walk in that way really, really creating a reality where these rivers can run clean and where the thousands of generations to come can find clean waters, where we leave a planet um, more beautiful, more clean, more respected, more honored than the one that we found. That's like the best contribution that we can make. And so through our physical healing, our emotional healing, our spiritual healing, through regulating ourselves on all those levels, we we have such a profound impact that we can make through, you know, the practical way of going and interacting with individuals and also the fact that we are microcosms of the macrocosm. So as I repair my microbiome within, I en envision and imagine the microbiome of the soil repairing. I envision and imagine the earth dreaming up a type of fungus that loves to digest glyphosate and just eats it all up overnight. Like I know that all things are possible. And so, yeah, I hold that vision like that. That's a be beautiful intention in prayer and vision. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And I think that that way of not only thinking, but feeling and being is something that we can all access for ourselves. Like what is the vision that is greater than us? You know, maybe not in such a way of like, oh, how can I be of service? And and then we ask, add more stress to our inner world, but just thinking about like, what are some of the things we are passionate about? What would we like to see? And then carrying that vision and intention, just like you laid out. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you for sharing your wisdom on the pod. Thanks for being here, Megan. And guys listening, be sure to go to the show notes and connect with Megan. As you can tell, she is a wealth of information. So Megan, once again, for coming. Thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll talk soon.